Welcome to episode 29 in our series on Rabbi Moshe Chaim Luzato's The Path of the Just. And in this episode, we are continuing at chapter 19, uh, The Elements of Piety. It's a long chapter, so we're going to have to feature it in many, uh, well, eight or nine episodes. And uh, we're up to the second part now. And uh, in the first part of this chapter, we dealt with examples of piety with various great sages of past times. And in this episode, we're going to deal with the concept of gimelut chasadim, or acts of kindness, and how piety is derived through these acts. So the Ramchal begins. Gimelut chasadim, or acts of kindness, are fundamental to a pious person, for piety itself, chasidus, is derived through chesed. The sages of blessed memory have said, and he quotes from Pirkei Avos, chapter 1, Mishnah 2, the world stands on three pillars, one of which is Gemelot Chasadim. I believe that that was quoted by Shimon HaTzadik. And they of blessed memory have enumerated it amongst those things. And he quotes from Peah, chapter 1, Mishnah 1, whose fruits a person enjoys in this world and whose capital endures for him in the world to come. Furthermore, they said in Sota 14a, Rav Shimlai expanded. The Torah begins and ends with Gimilut Chasadim. And they further said in Yevamos 79a, Rava expounded, anyone who possesses the following three traits is clearly descended from Avraham Avinu, compassion, shyness, and kindness. And also, he quotes from Sukkah 49b, Rab Elazar said, Gimilut Chasadim is even greater than charity, as it says in Hosea chapter 10, verse 12, sow for yourselves with charity and reap with chesed. So it's very interesting, that quotation. Sow for yourselves with charity and reap with chesed. Perhaps indicating that the Gemilut Chasadim is such a powerful a deed that you will receive, perhaps in this world, a kind of benefit uh, from this. As it says, sow for yourselves for chari- with charity and reap with chesed. So perhaps sowing is for the world to come. Reaping is such a powerful deed as you may be uh, also return something within you this lifetime. And also, he quotes from Sukkah 49b, In three respects, Gimelut Chasadim is greater than charity. Charity is accomplished with one's money, whilst Gimelut Chasadim is done with the one's physical being. Charity is for the poor, while Gimelut Chasadim is for the poor and the wealthy alike. Charity is for the living, while Gimelut Chasadim is for both the living and departed. Um, <clears throat> and now the Ramchal is going to describe how one who performs acts of mercy and benevolence is judged mercifully by Hashem. And he continues, and it states in Shabbos 151b, that he may grant you mercy and be merciful to you. That's from Devorim 13.18. means that heaven is merciful to all who have mercy on their fellow creatures. This is self-evidence, for the Holy One, blessed be He, operates with the principle of measure for measure, and one who is merciful and benevolent towards his fellow creatures will, when he is judged, be judged with mercy, and all of his sins will be benevolently forgiven. This exoneration shows an exact justice, since measure for measure has determined it. This is what our sages of blessed memory have said, and he quotes from Rosh Hashanah 17a, whose transgression does he, the eternal pardon, that of the one who overlooks the sin that another has committed against him. If one is unwilling to make concessions in his own demands, or is unwilling to act with kindness, reason dictates that he too should be treated with the same measure of exactitude. But can you imagine that there was a person alive who would be able to withstand being judged by the Holy One, blessed be he, according to the measure of exactitude? David HaMelech prayed when he said in Tehillim 143 verse 2, And do not enter into judgment with your servant, for no living being can find justification before you. Simultaneously, 
He who engages in chesed will receive chesed in return, and the more he engages in it, the more he will receive. King David was able to exult in the possession of this excellent virtue. He would even try to be benevolent towards those who hated him. This is what he referred to when he said, also from Tehillim, 35, 13. And I, when they were ill, clothed myself in sackcloth. I afflicted my soul with fasting. And also from Tehillim 7, verse 5, if I have repaid with evil those who were at peace with me. So very important, we must learn to forgive our enemies quickly, turn the other cheek, <clears throat> imagining the same way that we must be a reflection of Hashem, uh, where He forgives us. Sometimes when we, don't, we don't deserve to be forgiven. He forgives us because we know ultimately, if we are genuine, it will lead to an improvement in, our, in ourselves. And we are remorseful, more importantly. So the same with your fellow man or woman, if you have a broigus or an argument with them or you have a falling out, it's better to turn the other cheek and offer your hand as an olive branch because no goods can ever come of a, an argument or a falling out. All it does is freeze over over time and it becomes impossible to actually defrost. As we all know, all of us have had those sort of situations in our lives. So we must, in the beginning, as soon as possible, turn the other cheek, try and detach yourself emotionally from the situation and realize that only good can come from patching things up quickly. When you leave things, they, they t tend to um, foster and, uh, and, kind of, um, and become uh, acidic very, very quickly. And the Ramchal continues... Uh, the virtue of piety also requires that one should not cause any creature to suffer, even animals, and should show mercy and compassion towards them. Similarly, it says in Mishle 12.10, the righteous man knows the soul of his beast. And there are those who are of the opinion that causing an animal to suffer is a prohibition on the Torah, as from Shabbos 128b. And at the least, it is a rabbinic enactment. In summary, compassion and benevolence must be permanently engraved in the heart of the pious, and one's objective should always be to please his fellow creatures and not to cause them any suffering. This is very, very important. Uh, anybody who knows me would know that I am um, a big supporter of the concept of tsar balechaim, or compassion towards animals. I think we are living in a time where our consumption of, uh, of food has become, a danger, has become dangerous for ourselves and for the planet. And it is, it is beholden on us to take stock of what the situation that it, as it is today and say to ourselves, do we really need to, to be uh, putting animals uh, through suffering before... Uh, I'm not talking about the Shechita uh, Act. I'm talking about before that, so that when they are reared for our consumption it's not necessary anymore and we know that it is causing huge damage to the planet so there's a double reason to think and take stock of what we're doing and realize that Saba Lechaim is one of the most important uh, laws that uh, determines our future how we are we all know that this is one world and we are charged to look after it therefore um, we must uh, act like an older brother uh, or the responsible older uh, sibling in God's world. And we must look after the planet and its inhabitants and have respect for them. Um, and, um, and the Ramchal continues. The second component of piety concerns its application. This too incorporates two principles, which includes many details. The two leading principles are fear and love of the eternal. These are the two pillars of true divine service, without which piety could never establish itself. Fear of the eternal includes submissiveness before the Blessed One. The, recitance felt, the reticence felt as one approaches the eternal service, and the honor accorded to his mitzvot, his name and his Torah. The love of the eternal comprises joy, cleaving to him and zealousness. We will now explain them one by one. 
So first, he, the Ramcha begins with awe of the Eternal's exaltedness. So he continues. The principal aspect of fearing the Eternal is awe of his exaltedness. One must realize while praying or performing a mitzvah that he is doing so before the King of all kings, as the Tana has exhorted us in Berachot 28b, and when you pray, know before whom you are praying. In order to attain this type of fear, there are three things that one must hold in view and contemplate carefully. The first is the realization that he is literally standing before the Creator, may his name be blessed, and conducting a discourse with him, even though he is not visible to us. And this, you should note, is the most difficult of the three to envision effectively in one's heart, since one's perceptions are of no assistance here. However, one who, who is of sound mind can, with only minimal contemplation and thoughtfulness, implant in his heart the truth, how he literally enters into a discourse with the Blessed One, how he implores him and entreats him, and how the Blessed One listens to him and is attentive to his words, just like one piece, person speaks to another and the other listens attentively to him. So this is very true. It is hard to imagine, as the Ramchal is pointing out, but God listens to every, not only spoken word or spoken prayer, but every thought that we have, any minor thought, every passing thought, every time we recall a memory, he's watching that. Every time we try to analyze something in our mind, he analyzes it, analyzes the way we're analyzing. It's very important to understand that every aspect of our mental uh, sphere is, uh, is completely um, governed and uh, analyzed by God. And the Ramchal is going to describe now the second uh, of these three types uh, of views one must hold. Is the second is contemplating the exaltedness of the Eternal. And he continues, After he has established this in mind, he must probe the exaltedness of the Blessed One, that he is exalted and lofty beyond all blessing and praise, and all forms of perfection that could possibly be imagined and contemplated. Next, he must contemplate the humble nature of man and his baseness, which derive from his crude corporeality and particularly from all the sins that he has ever committed. Thus, after contemplation in these three areas, it will not be possible for one's heart not to fear and tremble while speaking before the Blessed One, while mentioning his name and attempting to find favour before him. Now the Ramchal is going to bring verses from scripture illustrating this awe of God's exaltedness and he continues this is what scripture states and he quotes from Psalms 2 verse 11 serve the eternal through fear and rejoice through trembling and it also states in Psalms 89 verse 8 God whose grandeur is in the great council of the holy ones and whose awesomeness is all over the is all over who surround him for the angels being closer to the blessed one than physical beings find it easier to envision the praise of his greatness consequently his awe affects them to a greater extent than it affects human beings Nevertheless, King David, may peace be upon him, was accustomed to praising heaven and said, also from Psalms chapter 5, verse 8, I will bow towards your holy base of Mikdash in awe of you. And it is written also in Malachi chapter 2, verse 5, and he trembled before my name. And it says also in Ezra 9, 6, My Lord, I am embarrassed and ashamed to raise my face towards you, my Lord. Uh, and now the Ramchal is going to describe the outer manifestations of the fear of God. And he continues, This fear, however, must first rule over one's heart, and only then will one see its influence reflected in other parts of his body as well, in a bowed head and with body inclined forward, lowered eyes and hands clasped together in the manner of an insignificant servant before a king. Similarly, the Talmud states in Shabbos 10a, Rava clasped his hands together and prayed, and he commented, just as a servant does before his master. 
So beautiful words of the Ramchal, bringing um, the sort of manner that we should uh, be in, the manner, the state of mind that we should be in as a humble servant before his master. And even as Rava used to do, clasped his hands together as if and bowed his head as if he was a, uh, uh, a servant of God, which he was. Um, this is the um, this is the mindset that we have to adopt when praying to actually realize that it's not just words that are going um, going somewhere that is very far away. God is with us all the time, and He listens to every word, and He acts on every word that we request every prayer that we have in his time and in his manner but every word is is uh, is consumed by him and is is um, is processed by him and um, and delivered in in his way so in the next episode we're going to stop there in the next episode we're going to carry on with the idea of honor uh, which is the next uh, subject that this chapter 19 deals with.